Hello and welcome to the GNT podcast. Right. Pastor Gunner and Pastor Titus are here. Um, Gunner in Texas and Pastor Titus up in Helenville, Wisconsin, coming to you this morning. Um, well, it's morning for us anyway. And we are at part four in the People's Bible for First and Second Thessalonians, still in First Thessalonians. And part four is titled Living to Please God, chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 12. I'll begin by reading verses 10 through 13. And may God bless our time meditating on his word today. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So far the text and now the commentary. This is on page 35 if you're following along in the book. The fact that Timothy's report was such a good one did not mean Paul would forget about the Thessalonians. He kept praying that he would be able to visit them soon. The persecution still went on. The Thessalonians needed to be strengthened in their faith and devotion to Christ. Whatever they lacked in their faith, Paul wanted to supply by seeing them and sharing God's word with them again. But unless Satan's roadblocks were removed, Paul knew he would never get back to Thessalonica. He realized that the only one who could clear the way was God himself. So Paul prayed that God would put enough of a damper on the persecution so he could return without foolishly endangering his own life and without stirring up even greater suffering for the believers in Thessalonica. Lest the Thessalonians feel they could not grow in faith without a visit from Paul, he has a third prayer. In this prayer, he asks the Lord to bless and strengthen the Thessalonians. He reminds them, it is really God, not Paul, who sustains them. Paul asks that the Lord would increase their love to the point of overflowing, like a cup that fills with water and then overflows. So Paul prays that their hearts might overflow with love. As on a hot day, we fill a cup with cold water, letting the delightful sparkling liquid splash over into our hands. So a Christian's love brings joy to all that it touches. God had brought these people into a new spiritual family by faith, a family in which each member was responsible for the other. All worked together for the good of the whole family. Here was a family in which strengthening, comforting, and encouragement of one another from God's word was a daily experience, especially in their present persecution. So they were to love one another. Nor does Christian love stop within the family of believers. It overflows for everyone else as well. Love for unbelieving neighbors and friends expressed in deeds as well as words. Love for government officials and employers expressed in Christian subordination. And yes, love also for the Jews who were persecuting Christians, just as Christ loved his enemies and prayed for them. Paul can't refrain from adding a reminder of his own love for them. He urges that their love overflow, just as ours does for you. With these words, he encourages the Thessalonians to be imitators of himself, Silas, and Timothy in love, just as they had followed them in enduring persecution. Paul adds the result of making their love increase to overflowing. They would be, quote, blameless and holy, end quote, when Christ comes on the last day. And the quote, strengthening of your hearts, end quote, of which Paul speaks is an inner strength, their whole beings, their thoughts and their feelings. God looks past the outward actions people perform. He searches the heart to see whether their actions are born of faith in Christ, actions done to thank Christ for his saving work. Any action, no matter how beneficial to others, is not pleasing to God unless it flows from a heart filled with such faith. As Hebrews 11.6 states, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Deeds of love that flow from faith are proof that faith is alive and well. Someday, when Jesus returns in glory, everyone will stand in the presence of God and be judged. 
Believers will be known by the deeds of faith that Christ recounts. Revelation 20, 12 says, Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. It is often debated whether Jesus is coming with all his holy ones means with the angels or with believers. The expression, holy ones, is an expression that Paul uses elsewhere in his letter only to refer to believers. Here, Paul has just finished speaking of believers being blameless in holiness. When Paul speaks of Christ coming with all his holy ones, this simply refers to all those believers who have died and whose souls are with Christ in paradise. Later in 4.15, Paul will speak of how these believers will return with Christ and share a glorious reunion with the living believers. Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is a beautiful prayer for us to use. Let us pray for our fellow believers that our love for one another and everyone else might increase to overflowing. Then, when Christ comes in judgment, our deeds of love will stand as undeniable evidence of our living in Christ. So far, the commentary. And I'll turn it over to Pastor G. Hey. The, these opening verses, I often have people... Uh, I talk with and I'm inviting to Bible study and they they say, well, but I don't I don't really know anything about the Bible and you know I'm nervous and I don't wanna I don't wanna be there and you know people are talking, I don't know what they're talking about. And I often tell them I use the picture, why do people go to college? It's to learn. You would never say, well, I don't think I can go to go to college or start classes or some kind of an apprenticeship because I don't know anything. That's precisely why you go to college or start some kind of an apprenticeship is to learn all those things. And so it's the same with Bible study and Paul's praying that he would come and supply what they lack in their faith. And he's not saying they don't have faith or that they're somehow, they've done something wrong or they're inferior because they're lacking in faith or that it's even a lack of knowledge or content in their faith necessarily. Uh, but that he wants them to continue to grow in faith. They simply, he wants to get there and continue to encourage them. Like that's what, that's a big aspect of the Christian life is to gather together and grow uh, in the faith, uh, better. I think that's an awesome, awesome point because I think, I think we're so careful because we don't want to give ourselves credit for salvation. So we hate talking about any Christian advancing or like getting better. And we don't want to say like, Oh, this person's a better Christian than that Christian because of this or that. And obviously, you know, you got things figured out and I don't, <laughs> but, but, Scripture does talk a lot about maturing in the faith. Right. And even if we can say like, okay, that person's been a Christian for a long time and they look like they got things figured out. In all honesty, they're struggling with things too. May not be the same thing as you. We're all sinners and we will be until we die. However, we do grow up in the faith as we study God's word, we learn more about him. And that's a process that we go through life long. And uh, always something we can pray for and look for. I, I'm more and more, and I want to keep doing this, challenging the members here and myself and my family. Like, let's go. Let's level up. Like, I'm not saying leveling up like I'm going to be in a higher level in heaven than you. But I mean, like, I'm going to actively dive deeper and grow deeper into God's word. I want to know more. I want to mature. I want to be prepared for bigger challenges. If that means God needs to test me, so be it. You know, it's just like, yeah, so I love the prayer. Great point. Yeah. And that is what Paul is, again, these, the Thessalonians are facing intense persecution. And like he says many times, the persecution is not evidence that they are doing something wrong, but it's evidence that they're on the right track. And so he wants to encourage them. And even these, you know, verses 10 through 13 are like three sections. And 
it's like the opposite almost, or it's kind of jumbled how we generally uh, maybe talk about things where the first one is, you know, wanting to dig into the word, increase faith through some kind of means, like meeting together in word. Then verse 12, he jumps into what we would probably label as sanctification. And then 13 is more like justification, like I want you to be, you know, seen as holy, having faith guaranteed going to heaven at the end. And the order, right, is interesting. Because mm -hmm. um, he does start out with the means, right? This is how your faith is strengthened, is by digging into God's word. Like Paul would come preach and teach to them to supply what their faith was lacking. And then he dives right into how you live your life, right? Your love, which is the essence of the commandments, right? When Jesus gets asked, you know, what are the commandments? And he gives two. Love God, love your neighbor. But the, the essence, the connector is love. We have love that goes up to God. We have love that goes horizontally uh, to our neighbors. And all of that, being in the word, living out your faith, uh, is justification and sanctification. Being saved and living as a saved person cannot be pulled apart. Like, if you're saved, you'll live this way. If you're living this way, it's because you have been saved by God. And so that's where he flows into that justification um, passage. So it's, no, it's all. I'm glad you laid that out. Because, yeah, like the terms, we keep them very distinct because it's very important that we understand yeah. our role in salvation, which is nothing. Justification right. is all God. He has saved us. He's paid for all of our sins. And through Jesus and faith in him alone, we will be saved. So that's justification sanctification then is how that comes to us and what it does to us so as we believe in that wide sense of sanctification um, god has set us apart and he does that through the holy spirit when he brings us to faith either through baptism or believing the word and then in the narrow sense now god is refining us daily as that truth transforms us from the inside but on a daily basis and in the reality of a christian these things are so intertwined and connected. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. Like if you learn something and you believe it, it will change your actions. Right. That's what, that's what the connection is and what he's saying here. So as you learn more about God, as we pray about you, as you are persecuted, mm -hmm. it will drive you to take the love that you're learning about and holding to, and it will automatically transfer to the people around you because that's what you believe and you act it out. So um, scripture, this is where like, if you're reading the Bible and you're like, yeah, it's really hard for me to tell. Yeah, it is because they're so connected mm -hmm. and um, the practical and the spiritual are always meant to be connected. And when they're separated, that's called Gnosticism <laughs> where knowledge is in your head and you're like, yeah, I believe this, but I'm going to live this way. Like, no, you're a walking paradox. Like you're, and yeah, that doesn't mean you don't struggle because we're sinners and we are a paradox that way. But I mean, if we truly believe it, it will be communicated in action. Um, this is why a lot of wedding or marriages aren't so good because they'll be like, we'll I love you. But then everything you do by your actions communicates the opposite. What happens in the marriage? It doesn't go well because you are not loving in action. Interesting fact is love in the Bible is often described as an action right if not if not always as an action like first corinthians 13 it's all action words love is patient love is kind um so when i'm in counseling with those couples i'm like if you love them then do it yeah show them like put it into practice don't just sit on the couch when you could be doing something for her or him um show love love if you mean it then do it. And that's kind of how God talks. He's like, if you believe in me and you're not doing it to, so I'm saying it in a way, like prove it to me. And God does kind of challenge us, but it's not like prove it so that I will love you. He loves us regardless, but he does urge us to, for our own benefit, to practice what we believe so that we see it in our lives and others get to benefit from it. Yes. So it's not for him. In that sense, we do it out of thanks for him, but it does help need in that truth into our life the more we practice it. 
So it blesses us. It's beautiful. Yep. And that's just like what John 316, right? God says he loves the world, but it's not. I have this emotional, you know, just I just have a feeling about the world, but I love the world so that it leads me to this action of sending my son with the intended purpose that through faith, you are saved eternally and do not die and go to hell forever. And so faith or love is always action. God's love for us is always action. And similar with parenting, I tell lots of parents this, the word parent is not a title. Like, oh, I'm a parent now because I have a kid or whatever. <laughs> uh, parent Yay. is a, right, parent is a verb. It's action. So if you're you know, a parent, but your kids are, you know, they're school aged and they're in school all day and then they come home and they're in front of a screen all day and you, you spend no genuine time with them, you are not parenting them. You are not parenting them. And that is not good. You are meant to be active in their life. Mm. Uh, you know, like that's that's how it works. That's love is action. Parenting is action. Like you said, in marriage, it's activity towards your spouse. It's not just all the lovey-dovey, gushy feelings that I say because it sounds good and maybe it gets me something in the moment, but it's this constant activity for them, even unseen activity, even unpleasant activity, even activity that takes work, even if it's activity when uh, my spouse or my kids or these other people aren't being loving back to me. And that's what he gets at in verse 12. Uh, your love increase for each other as a congregation and everyone else, like all those other people that you see, whether it's a stranger, whether it's somebody you're like, I would never talk to that person because they're this, that, or the other thing. He says your love would increase for everyone else. Uh, that's how it works. Like it said in the commentary, right? Even for the people who are persecuting, your love is for them. Doesn't mean what they're doing is right um, or that they're gluttons for punishment or they're seeking like martyrdom or something like that. But to recognize those are hurting people that have been caught by the devil. And my battle is not against those people, but it is against Satan. And I will fight against Satan with my loving actions, my patience, my kindness, my gentleness, my respect, and with the word of God. Because that ultimately wins battles for God. Right? And that's yeah, and if you, just one quick comment. Um, yeah. Good podcast. They always interrupt each other. So that's why I have to do that. Right. <laughs> um, no, both Gunner and I get excited, so yeah. we can go on and just get passionate. Um, but if you're wondering, like, how do I do that? Like, how do I love my enemies? I don't even want to love my family. <laughs> not that okay. any of you would not want to love your family, but Gunner was just telling me his whole family is puking. So sometimes it's hard when there's a throw up all over your floor and everywhere. And it's like, uh, okay, I love you, but this is not fun. But this is the reason I bring that up. Yeah. How do you do that? Practice, practice, practice. What What do we do in every sport if you want to get good at it? You do it over and over and over again. I think this is left out so often. People are like, yes, I want to believe in God more. And I want to have more hope. And I want to feel less anxious and depressed. And trust me, I deal with those things. I'm not putting it lightly. Okay, then... How about you listen to the advice God gives? His advice is practice obedience. Practice listening to me. Practice what you preach. Because then it becomes more a part of your life. And in very simple terms, what does that mean? It means take out your phone, get your Google Calendar open, and put in times in there and says, I'm going to pray for 30 minutes this morning. Right. I'm going to read the Bible for 30 minutes this morning. I'm going to make sure that if I'm going to miss church on Sunday, I'm going to go on Thursday. Why? Because I have to? No, but because at these things, I get God's word. And then I'm going to schedule in other times where I'm going to pray for my enemy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make myself pray for the politician I don't like. 
I'm going to set aside time to pray for the person who's hurting me right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to actively leave my house and plan to bring a, bring dinner to someone in church that, you know, like we've been fighting for a while and no one's making the first move. I'm just going to drop off dinner on their porch and put a little card in it that says, has a verse in it that says, love one another as I've loved you. Just think how powerful that would be, that movement. And yeah, that's hard the first time. But if you're doing that every week, imagine how much easier it is in six months. So I think sometimes we overcomplicate it or we just like to say it like, man, I wish I wish God would help me and in, in this. And that's good. Say the prayer, ask God for help, but then do what he tells you to do yep. to feel like not only practically feel better, but also to grow in faith. It's very simple. It's just like it's just like everything else. If you want to be better at fitness, you want to be better at eating, you got to start with little bite-sized tasks. And as you get used to that, it gets easier. Mm -hmm. um, and God promises to bless that. And <laughs> when you do things in his name for him, he will bless you with faith. Yep. Sorry. I just that's something that is just becoming more and more evident to me at 36 finally who've preached this for a while. It's just like these little ordinary habits are so big. They are. And that's what, you know, your confidence is in Jesus for saving you. And uh, when your confidence is in Jesus, it shows itself in love for others. And that makes you blameless. Then on the last day, not because you did all these things, but because you had faith in Jesus, which produced all of these things. So just like it says there, yeah, when our Lord Jesus comes with us holy ones, you will be blameless and holy. Yeah, because of the faith you have in Jesus. Yep. Like that's the ultimate goal. Like I need to endure for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Good. All right. I'll read the, the next. We're starting chapter four. It's verses 1 and 2. It writes, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now the commentary. Paul's just prayed that the Thessalonians might overflow in deeds of love. From this point on, his letter concerns itself with how God wants Christians to live. Paul reminds his readers that when he was with them, he had given them some thorough instructions on this subject, even though he had been there only a very short time. They had taken this instruction to heart and had begun pattern, patterning their lives according to what Paul had taught them was pleasing to God. But they still have plenty of room to grow in Christian living. To help them in that direction would be Paul's goal in the rest of this letter. Paul knew they would gladly receive everything he told them in this regard, so he does not admonish or threaten them. Rather, he asks and urges. He does this asking and urging in the Lord Jesus. Paul did not want their motive for Christian living to be one of pleasing Paul. No, he wanted their Christian life to be motivated and empowered by Christ. Christ, not Paul, had lived and died for them. Christ, not Paul, had set them free from sin and death and made them heirs of eternal life. Paul's words to the Colossians 3.17 apply to the Thessalonians and apply to us today. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Why does Paul add the remark that they knew all the instructions he gave them or by the authority of the Lord Jesus himself? Verse 8 below gives a hint. There Paul stresses that to reject his instruction was not just a rejection of man, but of God. In our struggle with our sinful nature, old Adam, we need this reminder. The old Adam takes such pleasure in sin that he tries to convince us that living in the way he wants us to live really isn't so bad. He tries to persuade us that how we live is an individual matter, and we shouldn't let other people impose their standard of morality on us. It is then that we need Paul's reminder. 
The instructions about holy living found in the Bible are not man's, but are given by the Lord Jesus. That's the commentary. Hmm. When you started that, I was like, hmm, I just talked about that. Oh, that's cool. And but then as it went, like that commentary was really good because it brought out some powerful thoughts. Um, in those verses, it says, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. So this isn't for a person. This isn't for your pastor. This isn't for the other council member to see how good of a council member you are or for the other volunteers to see or for the other ladies to know that you're the best altar guild person ever. Um, and you know the right way and they all do it the wrong way. <laughs> you know, it's like when you serve for your God, social you media. Listen, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what for. Yeah, not for your following, not for your instas, not for you know, whatever it is. It's not right. for your filter. This is just for God. It's you and him, which adds a whole area of your life that other people don't see. When you pray in your room, when you pray in the morning, when you're getting ready, when um, no one else sees you, when you're changing that 15th diaper of the day from the diarrhea or cleaning up the puke on the bathroom and washing the clothes again, you know, it gives such power when you're like, I'm doing this for God. Yes, even the diaper. And then it's like, I'm not waiting for my spouse to see it and acknowledge that I'm such an awesome spouse. I'm doing it for God. He sees me. That's that's why I'm doing this, because the one who died for me is right here with me. You know, deep in the mess that I'm in, in the struggle that I'm going through, Christ is right here with me. And I, I want to make him proud because he called me to be his. I want to I want to please him to the best of my ability because I love him. Because he so loved me. And one day I get to spend eternity with him. And this is my opportunity right now when it's tough, when the going's tough, I have a chance to, you know, wrestle for him and with him and to save people by preaching him in my words and actions and in my struggle and in my honesty and my vulnerability. Um, and that's an opportunity. And that's what I like about this section. Uh, Pastor Nate Abram, Abrahamson, right now he's a pastor in Cottage Grove, an ELS pastor good friend of mine. We do Camp Rise together. Big plug for that um, in this area. And we have a blast. But one of the things that when we've had some ch chance, because we always like to wrestle with scripture together, um, we spent a lot of time talking about the law of God. And, you know, when we teach the Ten Commandments, like Gunnar and I, when we're doing confirmation, um, we talk about the Ten Commandments and it's like, do this and don't do that. And a lot of times the only message we give is, as Lutherans, and this is fine, is just saying, okay, do not murder. Don't think you are out of this commandment because you didn't murder. If you hate your brother, you are guilty of breaking this commandment. Remember what Jesus said. So repent of that. And then at the end of this lesson, the, the only thing I want to get you out of it is like you failed this commandment and you should be afraid. But now you don't have to be afraid because Jesus has saved you and he didn't kill anyone. He didn't hate anyone. So you're saved from this failure because his salvation is yours. That's very true. And that's awesome. But that's not where it stops for Christians. Yeah. So what changes when you become a Christian is you don't have to be scared of the law anymore. You do like David. I keep thinking of the Psalms and he says, I delight in the law of the Lord. And sometimes we change the translation, say like, well, the law, it's not just talking about the commandments, it's talking all of God's word, which is true. But we don't have to bend over backwards that far. We can be thankful. Hey, no, because I can genuinely say I delight in God's law. Does it always make me feel good? No, because it points out my sin. However, my new man, my new self that's born of God says, I want to live for God. I want to learn his will for me. I want to step into it more and more because I know his good will for me is so good for me. And the more I listen to him, the better my faith is, the better my life is in an eternal aspect. And it might be hard in the moment, but like I delight in God's law. I really do. And that that whole motivation changes when you trust the person who's saying it to you, when you trust your parent, for example, 
and they say like do this and you're like why and they say back because i said so um at first that can be annoying if you trust your voice more than theirs but notice if you change that way of thinking your mental habits change and you say well i trust god's voice more than mine you know what they don't have to explain it to me that person who's saying it died for me Okay, I need to stop second guessing that person. I'm just going to trust that their will for me is better. And as we get into God's will for sex and marriage, I think that concept is very important. Like, are we taking our will for sex and marriage or God's? And ultimately, do we think the creator knows this better than us or not? When we take a step back and think about that, of course he knows it better than us. And his will for us is good. He's told us that. Good. Yeah, especially, you know, bringing up, obviously we'll dig into the sixth commandment with this next section, but yeah, the fifth commandment and to go beyond justification, but into sanctification, beyond I've been saved, and now this is what my life looks like. And like, again, Psalm 119 is, you know, longest psalm, and it just constantly is praise for God's commands, laws, precepts. I mean, it says it uses multiple terms to just praise God's law. And you look at the fifth commandment, don't murder, and you look at it with new eyes and you go, God says, I want to protect life. God says, I'm the author of life. God says, uh, I want to preserve uh, people's existence forever and i want that to be a meaningful love-filled purposeful existence I, I want that for people and he has brought me onto his team right put his jersey on me clothed me with christ's righteousness save me i'm going to heaven i'm one of his people i'm an alien in this world but i'm living so i'm living as a citizen of heaven in this world so I now, until he brings me home to heaven, will live to protect life. Even if the people around me don't like that, I am going to do that because I see that God is protecting life. And that too is, so my other thought in this section is, it is wonderful to know that you are following the Lord Jesus and not man because man's expectations, laws, anything right now in this time, which, I mean, it's always existed. It's just the term we use, but like a social justice idea, like I am all in for this cause. Those things change so often. So if you are going to bind your life to following some man's or woman's laws or ideas for how life should live it will change all the time it will only exist in that sense in your context for a short time and then it will change that person will die or they'll something will happen and then you'll follow something else so that's not good it's always changing and that person doesn't actually give you the power to follow those things it's always going to fall on you to like i ah, keep doing it or just give up with God, his law never changes. It is actually good because, again, he's the creator. And he's the one that gives you the Holy Spirit and the power to follow God's law. I just saw a great uh, little short video of this illustrated. And I was like, man, this is such a simple illustration. <laughs> and it was a glove. And the person's talking. It's like, this glove can't do anything right? It can't write, it can't cook, it can't pick something up, it can't prune a, you know, rose bush or anything like that. Can't it's... slap anybody. Right, yeah, it can't slap anybody. Get a can't duel. challenge anyone to a duel. That's right, exactly. <laughs> None of that stuff. Uh, right, can't do surgery, like all these things, it's just a glove. But if you put your hand into that glove, it can do all that stuff. And it was like, that's us. Right, without God, we're just this glove that can't do anything. Gets blown around by the wind, tossed here and there. But with God, you can do such great things and you can love. And so yeah, great point. 
That's awesome. And I think just, again, just simplify it. Are, am I doing this to please God or please men? Right. I mean, if you just think about that in every situation I'm here, am I doing this to please people or God? And when you're in a moral dilemma, one thing that Steph and I say to each other, and I really appreciate it because sometimes, you know, like pastors get tired too and like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then she'll say to me or I'll say to her, like, what's the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And what that forces you to sit back and be like, okay, is it about me pleasing my exhaustion or my feelings of woe is me or like pleasing someone else or even pleasing my family in this moment? Not saying that family is not important, like not never saying that, but um, what's the right thing to do gets me to think, what does, what does God want here? And that just always reframes the way I'm thinking about things. So that's been a powerful tool for me um, to use just in deciding what my actions will be. Good. Good. Yeah, which is it right? So is it righteous? Like the fruits of repentance, uh, the fruits of repentance aren't, you know, running back to sin, but it's struggling against sin. It's the fruits of repentance are working to live a right, a righteous, good, loving God pleasing, other people serving life. So good. Yeah. All right. I'll read the next section. Um, so this is chapter four, verses three through eight. Uh, title for the section is God's will for sex and marriage. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. So far, the word of God in the commentary. Sexual immorality was rampant at the time of the New Testament was written. The Thessalonians lived in a society in which premarital sex and marital unfaithfulness were commonplace and considered normal. Paul reminds them, however, that God wants them to live lives quite different from those of their fellow men, lives in which they consciously and continually drown the sinful old Adam and put on the new man in the matter of sex and marriage. God wants his people to avoid sexual immorality. More literally, these words could be translated, hold yourself completely apart from sinful sexual intercourse. Since our old Adam is quick to try to get us involved in sinful sex, we need to keep our distance from every situation in which the old Adam would have a chance to mislead us. Paul applies this especially to our thoughts and actions in courtship leading to marriage. You will find various translations for verse 4 because the Greek word for, quote, vessel or body, footnote, is wife in the NIV, is a very general term. So perhaps the best translation in the context is, let each of you know how to obtain a marriage partner in a way that is holy and honorable. Greek men often sought a wife as a sex object, or as Paul puts it, in passionate lust. They were most interested in how good looking a woman was. The more physically attractive a woman was, the more passionately they lusted to have sex with her. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Many popular love songs and love stories in movies and on TV today promote the same idea in the matter of sex and marriage. You marry someone to have sex. And if you can't wait, you have sex before you are married. Or you have an affair while married or with someone who is married simply because you are in love with that person. God says all this is sin. It is a kind of sexual immorality from which Paul urges us to keep away. Instead, the Lord wants us to go about finding and choosing our marriage partner in a way that is holy and honorable. And remember, behind God's will lies his wisdom and his love. He gave marriage and the fulfillment of the sex drive as a gift of his love for us. 
He knows how we will be able to enjoy this gift to the fullest. The path God commands is the only one to follow, so that Satan will not be able to turn this gift to ashes in our mouths. The devil does this in the lives of many who follow the sinful, passionate lusts that he promotes in their hearts. As God's children, let us choose our, choose our marriage partners in the knowledge that marriage is a holy estate. It is an estate in which God joins a husband and wife together in a lifelong union. In this union, God blesses us with companionship, sexual happiness, and children. And we keep this in mind, then, the way we go about obtaining a marriage partner is bound to be different from the world around us. Paul says the people of the world do not know God, so their ways should not surprise us. We, however, do know God. We need his wisdom and power to resist our sinful nature. With the Lord's help, we will strive to follow his way rather than the way of the world that can influence us so easily. Sex is a part of marriage, so sexual attraction is an important part of choosing a marriage partner. But the holy and honorable way does not concentrate on whether he or she is sexy. It looks for a lifelong companion with whom one can share joys and sorrows with whom one can share sex as an expression of oneness, and with whom one eagerly desires the gift of children, to train for this life and the next. Perhaps Peter expressed the thought most simply when he described a Christian couple as those who live together as heirs with one another of the gracious gift of life. Paul continues, In this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Since the matter Paul has just spoken about is the choosing of a marriage partner, these words warn against any tampering with a relationship between a couple that is becoming very serious and obviously approaching engagement. If I take advantage of someone in such a relationship by using my looks or wealth to take the man or woman away from that person, I am doing wrong. Knowing what a precious gift of God marriage is, and knowing from these words of Paul that God wants us to be holy and honorable in choosing a marriage partner, how could I begin to toy around with courtship in such a way? No sin in regard to marriage and sex should ever be a light matter to us. The Lord will punish men for all such sins. Quote, all who engage in sexual immorality are calling down God's wrath upon themselves. Paul doesn't mention this to the Thessalonians merely in passing, but gives them a crystal clear warning because of the predominance of the sin in their society. He repeats the warning later in this letter so it won't be forgotten. When the Lord calls a Christian to faith, he does not call that person to be impure, but to live a holy life. God doesn't wash away our sins so that we might return like, quote, a dog returns to its own vomit, quote, end quote, or like, quote, a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud, end quote, 2 Peter 2, 22. Christ redeemed us from sin to make us his own. We are, in Luther's words, to live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. This means that we thank Christ by the holy lives we live, also in the matter of sex and marriage. Lest the Thessalonians forget, Paul again emphasizes that he is not imposing his own or some other man-made morality on them. This is God's holy will. To toss it aside as being out of date, hopelessly naive, is a rejection of God himself, especially God the Holy Spirit. Sexual sins are committed against the very body in which the Holy Spirit lives as his holy temple. The Spirit's dwelling in us, therefore, is totally incompatible with indulging ourselves in sexual immorality. I got to read that sentence again. The Spirit's dwelling in us, therefore, is totally incompatible with indulging ourselves in sexual immorality. Quote, flee from sexual immorality, end quote. Paul wrote elsewhere, quote, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body, end quote. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. And so far, the commentary, mic drop. Indeed. Go ahead, Pastor G, take it away. It is. Along the same lines that we were talking about before, so again, God wants his gift of life protected 
and he wants his gift of sex protected. God is our creator, which means he created sex. All the aspects of it. He wanted it to be a thing. We weren't like, you know what would be cool is if, if sex was a thing. God's like, oh man, I didn't even think of that. Good <laughs> idea, humans. No, it was his idea. As like, an- God, we would like for something to feel good and like this would be right. nice and physically. Like, we didn't come up with that. <laughs> so, we also think kids would be cool. Like another generation, not just two people and they die. And it was like, hmm. oh man, I guess we'll just have to create new people. No, like that's his, this is how you do this. And you got to fill out an application and then a stork comes and drops him off. Oh, that's right. Yeah, or all the other, yeah, there's lots of ways. We won't dig into that, but there's lots of ways to get children these days that are interesting. And <laughs> yeah, that's another topic for another day. Right. We'll dig into that someday. The, create the creation account when god makes adam and the care god takes in telling us how he created adam and eve again shows this is my gift to you uh this is a major part of humanity is sex and how it relates to marriage and he creates adam just adam a male man a very obvious you are a man because of how you look your parts all those things down to your dna all that stuff and he has adam name all the you know all the animals walk in front of him he sees them paired up uh you know male and female and uh, realizes that he's alone right there's no helper for him And that term helper is not a derogatory term. That term helper is a term that God applies to himself often. In the Old Testament, God is our help. So it's not a bad term. Uh, Really, so God allows Adam to fall into a deep sleep, takes one of his own ribs, his own flesh. The only time that life comes from a man, right? The rest of that is it's going to come from woman, which is another just beautiful thing. And he creates woman, and Adam sees her, and it's the first recorded poem, love song, uh, and he just breaks out, and this is, right, uh, this is me, this is my flesh standing in front of me, and in the Hebrew, too, as they're standing, looking there at each other, it's very literal, like, this is, this is my counterpart, these are the pieces that fit, physically, like, sexually, this makes sense, uh for us to enjoy one another and for us to have children like and so that's what god protects that's what he wants and that becomes that foundation for all of society the foundation of a man and a woman uh that seek to have children and some people aren't able to have children uh doesn't mean you fail god doesn't mean you're not keeping his command to be fruitful and increase in number and somehow you failed him and you're going to go to hell and there's no way that, you know, you're forgiven or loved or valued or things like that. That doesn't, that's not how that works. But that's the foundational piece of society. And too, throughout history, you've seen societies where that gets lost and those societies crumble uh, because you're going against God's very simple directive for people. And so this is what he's looking to protect and that's why Paul writes on this is because sexual immorality was rampant at the time of Paul. It is today. It was, you know, with Adam and Eve, boom, they felt shame right away, instantly, right? Oh, we're naked. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just throughout. Like, this is dangerous. I can't just stay naked because it's, yeah, I'm vulnerable. I can't control myself, you know, just like everything. It's like, I need to be covered. I need to be protected from myself and from other people. It's like instantly that, yeah. Yep. Change oh, everything. Yep. And so then uh is looking for somebody attractive. Part of looking for, you know, as he continues on in this section, is that part of looking for a spouse? Absolutely. But it's not the only thing. It is not the one and only thing. There is also well, that's what I yeah, loved about that is like he's saying, you know, yeah, people obsess about it. Yeah, is that a part of it? Absolutely. 
But like he says, the holy and honorable way does not concentrate on whether he or she is sexy. It looks for a lifelong companion with whom one can share joys and sorrows, with whom one can share sex as an expression of oneness, mm -hmm. and with whom one eagerly desires a gift of children to train for this life. Those are all connected. I think that's yeah. one of the big advices I give for like pre-marriage counseling or just anyone like I do it for my seventh and eighth graders as I'm like, as you get into relationships, okay, just don't listen to the world and all the media that just tries to take sex as its own little thing. And like, this is the candy you need and you need to live your life to get the candy. No, if you eat that candy apart from a well-balanced diet, it's not, it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to give you diabetes. Um, <laughs> but right. more with sex, like our culture just talks about like, I need, this is my desire and I need to satisfy it. That's my goal. No, God says the, the sex, that, that wonderful pleasure that I have designed is built into a more beautiful system or relationship. Like it's meant to glue two people together. Right. So obviously if you're not in a committed relationship and you have sexual relations and then you break up, what happens? Extreme pain because sex is literally meant to mold you together as one. So when you do those things, with someone or i'll take it here too you do things to yourself to right. cause sexual pleasure um with masturbation or you're looking at porn and you're basically making a connection with a screen or an image and desire so this is lusting after someone who's not yours there's a lot that we can say there but then you are stealing this feeling but it's not connected to anything and you're left with nothing you're left with a void and sadness because you're stealing something and you're you're distorting so much what god wants you to have and that's why like yes it's sexual attractive appropriate yeah I like to think about that yes but what you're really looking for is the whole package you want to have someone you can be one with for the rest of your life to build this beautiful thing called marriage. This is holy estate um, where you get someone who is with you through the thick and the thin, who is physically connected to you, who um, is going to help you raise children, which is super important. You're going to need to be united on that so that you can be a united, beautiful family that has a safe nuclear um, protection aura over those children as they are raised up in the Lord and prepared to be men and women who will be good spouses for other people. So it all works together. You can't separate it. Family, marriage, sex, it's all built to create this family unit that protects and loves and imitates the Trinity. Yeah. You know, like in that type of beautiful, powerful relationship. Right. And to this is just on a practical note. When you live and you touched on it, when you live your life just for the sexiness or attractiveness or the lust, you like the people that you're after, or if you marry just for, you know, sexiness or attractiveness, just for those reasons, you will get older and your body will change. Uh, and I'm not saying people, you know, as you age, there's not attractiveness or attraction, but you will change. And if you were after a certain, you know, image or, you know, age range, or all those kinds of subjective things that will all change in your partner and you will change. So you may still think like, oh, I can go after, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But you change too. You get older. So mm -hmm. you may not, right? And so then, like you said, if you get into porn and looking at all these things, that becomes God because it consumes your thoughts, actions, time, money. That's called worship. So it's this is not just I'm breaking the sixth commandment, but you break the first commandment, no other gods. 
that's pulling you away from rest time, you know, in the third commandment, and all these, it's just this ripple effect that destroys you, which goes back it's to, just, and it's selfish. Right. And it goes back to serving a man. Like he said in verses one and two, like you're not called to follow man's teachings, but the Lord, you yourself are a man, a human being, man or woman. And so if you're following just yourself, that's not God. That's not the Lord Jesus. He has called you to something better, to live a holy life, not an impure life. And you reject the Holy Spirit that is inside you. So you destroy all those things that he was saying at the end of chapter 3. You ruin yourself for eternity. You ruin living your life in love. And you're rejecting God's word in doing that. So you throw all of that away for this thing that does not satisfy you, for these bottomless cravings that are perverse and wrong, uh, that on the whole aren't good for yourself, they're not good for society, they're not good for your partner, they're not good for children, and they're not good for God. And God has, like we said, established this beautiful thing called marriage that is not only sexually fulfilling, but fulfilling in all these other ways. He's like, that, seek that. And it will be so wonderful and fulfilling for you. Yeah, there's uh, there's so many things. Uh, gosh, now I have all these thoughts. I got to get them out. Um, okay, so just one of the the verse in there where it says the Lord. Uh, sorry, let's look at verse six. And in this manner, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. Uh, just a couple of points on that, like. Because a lot of people will think, well, you know, or if I'm just thinking lustful thoughts or I watch that movie or I'm in a room by myself watching porn, I'm not hurting anybody else. That is not true. Um, <laughs> throughout scripture and just knowing this as someone who has also gone through life as a young man and going through all of this, like it always, sin always poisons you and everyone around you. It doesn't matter if it's private and you don't think it does or not. That's not how spirituality works. Um, like I said, these aren't separate. You, you, when you practice things, they come out in every single way. Um, one of the dangers is if you are in a habit of lusting or watching things like that or thinking sexually, it will cause you to objectify people. It will cause you to be a sex addict. It will cause you to constantly be thinking about that versus about people's qualities. It will twist the way you look at relationships. Um, it will make you more focused on physical intimacy versus those deeper conversations you should be having. Um, let's say when you're dating, if you're just like, oh man, I'm so into them. And that's all you're thinking about. Well, then you're not having the conversations on like, how are we going to raise our kids? And how are we going to make sure we go to church every week? And like those deeper things, or does that person actually value the things that I love? Do we have similar passions? Like important things about lifelong relationships, like Gunnar said, beyond the physical, beyond the honeymoon year into 20, 30, 40 years of marriage. Do we have those big qualities that make us one that we can do life together and we're on the same page you got to have those kind of conversations and you can't do that when you have a fog around your mind that all you can think about is sex that is so simple and like c.s lewis says um, it's one of my favorite quotes from him humans are far too easily pleased his point is we settle for simple, basic desires. And that's what our world's telling us. Like, oh, just go have sex, do whatever you want, have premarriage sex or follow your desires, even if those are against a male and female desire and somewhere else. Go for it because that's what life is about. Living life for desire. Wow, that's such a cheap version of life. Good job. You just said I should be a kid that always eats candy. No, that is not God's will for us. God wants us to go deeper. Again, when you're a Christian and you get to know God and his love for you, you know that he's not just saying things to be a jerk. He's saying things because he loves us. And 
surprise, surprise, he's designed us. <laughs> he yep. knows what makes us function better in this life and the life to come. And we have to trust him, right? especially right now, because our culture is a lot like the Thessalonian culture right now. You know, a lot of people say like, oh, well, the stuff we're having now never happened before. That's crap. Yeah. Exactly. Um, in the time of the Bible, it was exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. And homosexuality was a big thing in the Roman Empire mm -hmm. and in Greek culture. And uh, it was the same then. There were pedophiles then. There was bestiality then. There was premarital sex. As we just read in this commentary, there was a ton of people being unfaithful in their marriages. Fluidity. And hurting their brothers. Yeah. Fluidity. Yeah. All of that stuff. And like dressing up transgender type of stuff that was happening then too that was really right. popular in the roman courts part of the reason why rome collapsed right. over the next 200 years because it kept going and going and going so all of this stuff existed before mm -hmm. and in the face of all of that paul says yes in your culture you are called to live differently God has a better will for you. And at the end, he gives the reason why. Therefore, he who rejects his instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Right. You do this because you have the Holy Spirit. You have faith in God. Right. He dwells in you. And in that other place, he says, like, you are a dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are his temple. He lives in you. This is connected. Your spirituality. You can't just go out and have sex and say it's not connected to your faith. It is. God lives in you. Everything you do physically is connected to your spirituality. These things are united. So practice what you believe. Yeah. Practice it and don't do the opposite or it will. Just like practicing the right thing, you practice the wrong thing, it leads you away from God. And that's why I read that one sentence twice at the end because so many people say that, um, that well, I can be a Christian, but I can practice and actively homosexual lifestyle for example um just had a, a a good discussion about that so there's a big difference if you struggle with desires that are counter to what god says that's one thing we all struggle with different sins um, desiring things that god says is wrong we all do this we're all the same um, whether it's lusting after a woman who's not yours or lusting after someone who's the same gender or lusting after someone else's car and coveting all of these things, you know, whether it's a sexual sin or something else for you. And I bet you it's all of the above in some way or shape or form. Uh, the point is like, we can't just say like, Oh, cause I desire that that makes it okay. Or I was born this way. We are born in sin. We are corrupted. That doesn't make it right. Um, what we want to do as we learn to love God is listen to him, even if our desires tell us something different in the moment, because we trust him on the bigger picture things and to help us see beyond our sinful nature and attain to living like a new man, someone who loves God with everything we have. Sorry, I got really excited in, yeah. on that tangent. but And to go along with that. Like you said, all of us struggle with these things and it manifests itself publicly, privately, in all, you know, whole spectrum of ways. And yes, you go against the Holy Spirit who lives in you and you pursue them. On the flip side, you have the Holy Spirit who has God living inside of you yeah, right. to help you struggle, not submit. And that's something uh that we we don't talk about it much we but this is what you're called to do as a christian is to struggle against things not submit to things and the struggle if your mind first goes to failure when it's struggle that's not what god is getting at struggling is fighting against it it is bearing up underneath it's just like lifting weights you yeah. know i'm struggling to push this bar up or I'm struggling to run that time or I'm struggling to, you know, do that burpee or do that Pilates thing or that cycling or whatever. Like that's the struggle is the pushing through the difficulty. And if you're like, well, yeah, I get that, but I submit 
so often and I'm just, you know, and then you get into this like pity party and God is like, come back to my word. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what, again, Paul was driving as like, I want to grow your faith, like get in there on those missing pieces. And sometimes it's content, but sometimes it's the struggle and the making God your best friend who's because he is always there with you. He lives inside of you and to go, okay, like I know in this situation or when I see this thing, like it's going to put me into that temptation. And God says, yep, I know that because I'm with you and I see it happening. And so in those moments, you immediately call out to God right before it. Like James, James is so pithy in his word pictures. It's just, he's wonderful. The book of James, right? Like, how sin, you know, temptation conceives and then it gives birth to sin and eventually it gives birth to death. Like, stop it in the moment before it goes too far. And you do that by relying on God. And then to pick up on another picture you were saying, this is, this is what God wants you to have with sex. This is the picture. There is a convenience store, right? Like, whatever, 7-Eleven, something like that. And then there is a five-star, whatever it is. Is it Michelin star? Is that the fancy? Yeah, or something like that. I don't know. Like there's a five-star restaurant next door. Okay, it was something that you go in there and you're getting like a five-course meal. You are tempted to go into the 7-Eleven and get, you know, Reese's and beef jerky. Now, I love Reese's and beef jerky. <laughs> Yes, he does. But what's way better than that is to go next door to this five-course meal. Now, you're going to be there a lot longer, but you are going to be so well-fed in that. And there's going to be so many different dynamics and layers to it and textures and flavors and savory and salty and sweet. And all of this is going to be catered and crafted for you. That's what God wants you to have with sex and with your marriage that's what he wants but it's cheaper it's easier it's quicker to just go to the you know 7-eleven and just get stuff but that ultimately doesn't satisfy you it's brighter shinier lights but it doesn't satisfy you and god's like i love that he wants you to be fed in this deep uh dynamic way so and like you can add the layer too, like if you guys have done any study on like man-made sugar and fructose and stuff and how addicting that is to your body. So like think about that with this analogy. Like you go to the convenience store once, you get addicted to the sugar and the sweets and how easy it was and how fast it was and how convenient it was. But it makes you less and less likely to go into that five-star restaurant and actually invest in the relationship that's real that's amazing and it you know, like it can you know make it harder so yeah Gunnar and I both just talking about warnings and I also want to bring the grace in here too like like you were saying you know like you think of failure when you think of struggle I tell people that come into counseling with me if you're struggling you're amazing you know like you're a Christian you're beautiful and uh we are called to struggle in this life. That's why it's called fighting for God, putting on the armor of God. This is a battle between your sinful nature, between the devil, between this world, and you cannot do it on your own. Yes, you will struggle and you will fail, but you have the Holy Spirit in you, which connects you to some very powerful things. First, it connects you to the forgiveness of God. And he says, I have washed you and I've made you new every morning. The past sins of yesterday are gone. Don't pick up shame and fall on the ground like a two-year-old who's been called out and saying, like, don't do that. <laughs> don't tell me that I did something wrong. It makes me, you know, like, and give up. Don't just flop there and lay down. And even if you do, guess what? God's going to come pick you up anyways. And you say, come on, dust it off. Let's go. I've made you new. <laughs> but just like, God is with you. He's not going to give up on you. He will be there with you every time you fail. It takes a lot of courage to fail and to try again and fail. 
but you have God with you. He will pick you up. Fight the fight of it. It is worth it. Get out of the addiction. Step away from pain and sadness and prison and walk through the open door. The door is open every morning again, even though you don't deserve that. That's the beauty of grace. And God will empower you to make different changes. One little step at a time. Trust him. Rely on him. Do the practical things and get help. Get accountability. Uh, one of the things I'll add to the show notes here is a website that are uh, that is uh, connected to our synod called Conquerors Through Christ. Mike Novotny, if you've seen him on uh, Time of Grace, was a big champion for this when it started. And a lot of our pastors and other people are involved with this who have struggled with porn or other things with sex around it. And it's an awesome resource for um, just anyone going through this or someone you know who's going through this. So I just wanted to add that too, because I got to wrap up here in a second. It's such a big topic and an important one. I just want to make sure that if you're going through that, just know you're not alone. Um, this is a huge issue in our culture and uh, something that we need to be more open to talk about and just be willing to stand in the gap and say there's something better for you that God has in store for you. And let's trust his voice more than our own. See, Gunnar, you just sent me another one. Yeah, that one's a little more broad. But yeah, put both in. That one's called what? Restinjesus.org? Yeah. yeah, it's resiliency. So it's all kinds of addictions and struggles Sweet. like that. But two, two solid, yeah, Conquerors Through Christ. Those are two solid uh, things to explore for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. We all, yeah. we all struggle with it. And we all know someone who struggles with like all those things. So I'll add a uh, Christian family solutions too. They actually have some awesome articles for talking to your kids about this. Um, that's a whole nother topic. I'd love to talk about, I'll save it for another day. But if you're a parent who's wondering, how do I prepare my kids for the sexual pervasiveness of the culture and the schooling and everything? How do I have those tough conversations and prepare them and talk about like, um, being pure or not, you know, having sex and why it's so important to protect yourself as well as other daughters and kings out there and not um, lead them into temptation. Go to uh, Christian Family Solutions. They have awesome articles there. Focus on the Family is another awesome website that I've gone to for articles on how to talk about that and to help protect and prepare your kids for the world out there. Yeah, awesome. Good. All right. Yeah, let's read the last section and yep, I'll get read going. It. Got six minutes, and then I got to get my kids ready for school. Cool. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Parenting is a verb. All right. I am going to read First Thessalonians chapter 4. This is 9 through 12. Now, about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is the word. Now the commentary. Paul moves on to another aspect of Christian living. It was rather common for Greek men to leave the manual labor to their wives and slaves. This left the men to spend their days in the marketplace. There they would gather to discuss political and economic issues and all too often to indulge in idle gossip. Thus they often became busybodies in other people's affairs. Paul urges the Thessalonians to gauge their lives in this matter, not according to the way most people live, but according to the brotherly love God taught them. When did God teach them this subject? When he brought them to faith. As a person comes to believe in Jesus, his heart is filled with love for God. And hand in hand with love for God comes love for one's neighbor. St. John wrote that it is impossible for a person who loves God not to love his brother also. Quote, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must love his brother. End quote. That's 1 John 4, 19 through 21. 
these thoughts parallel Paul's. Since the Thessalonians understood these truths, Paul says, we do not need to write to you. This was all the more evident from the fact that the Thessalonians loved moved them to share the gospel throughout Macedonia. But as he has done before in this letter, Paul urges them to grow even more in their practice of brotherly love, especially in avoiding the idleness and gossiping of their neighbors. The Greeks loved oratory. Greek men often had the ambition of using public speeches to sway large crowds. Oratory was one of the main studies Greek boys had to pursue. As well as producing great orators, this also resulted in a lot of loud mouths. In contrast to this, Paul urges the Christians to make it their ambition to lead a quiet life. This didn't mean they should stop telling others about the gospel. Nevertheless, they were to limit their talk to what was wholesome and helpful instead of pushy and overbearing. Rather than avoiding manual labor and indulging in gossip, God wanted the brotherly love which he had taught them to lead them to mind their own business, and to work with their own hands. Paul wasn't saying they should never concern themselves with helping their neighbors, or that it was wrong to make a living with one's head rather than his hands. Now the point is the principle of brotherly love. Being a busybody while refusing to work and support oneself violated this principle. These unbrotherly and thus sinful actions are the object of Paul's admonition. He gives two reasons for the admonition. The first is that if a Christian lives according to God's teaching about brotherly love, very often it will win the respect of outsiders. Acts of brotherly love will touch a responsive chord in all, but the most hardened even outside the Christian church. These people also have God-given consciences and will respect what they know is right. Their respect for Christians, brotherly love, might even be a tool God uses to prepare their hearts for the gospel. Secondly, it is important that Christians don't become leeches who live off others. God wants his people to provide for their own needs so they are not dependent on anybody. A person who refuses to work when work is available makes himself a nuisance. Paul will have much more to say about idleness in his second letter. Apparently, some members of the congregation continued in this sin despite Paul's admonition. We take up the whole matter of welfare and charity in more detail in the comments on 2 Thessalonians. But isn't it interesting to see in this section, as Paul begins to discuss a life pleasing to God, how specific he becomes in his instruction? He speaks directly to the Thessalonians' problems. And did it strike you how Paul's words are just as pertinent for our lives today as they were for the Thessalonians. May we also take these instructions on sex and on brotherly love to heart. They are God's will for us. They teach us the way of true freedom and lasting happiness. May the Holy Spirit help us follow them in thanks to Christ for his goodness to us. That's the section. Awesome. Well, Paul does a nice job of wrapping up, you know, kind of an intense section. And he's kind of like going down the list of things he needs to talk about in this letter. Because, all right, I got to hit sex and marriage. I got to talk about that. And then I have brotherly love written down here, but I don't really need to write to you about it. But I will say a few things about it, <laughs> um, which sounds like me. Like, oh, well, yeah, I'm just about done. I don't have anything to say about that. Well, I got one thing and then I'll talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but it's just cool. He just lays it out really simply, um, like against culture, underscore the marketplace and just chat with your buddies. Or if you're a lady, don't just go and hang out with your lady friends and gossip all day. But like, make your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands. Just so we told you, you know, you've probably heard the phrase like, you know, idle hands are the devil's playground or devil's, you know. Right. Play place. He can do whatever he wants with those because you're just sitting there and the opportunities are endless when you sit and think that's how the devil works. He waits for that opportunity. You know, even King David did terrible things when he stayed home idle and then saw Bathsheba and that led to some. And that was one thing like that led to a snowball. Yep. So what he's saying is like, lead a quiet life, stay busy. Use the gifts that you have. Keep yourself busy. Like that could be so many things. 
you know, like be at home and you love reading, read. Um, you love knitting, knit. You like picking up roadkill on the side of the road and skinning it, do it. That's Gunner, by the way. <laughs> and uh, um, if there's other things you like doing, like keep yourself busy. If you're good at building things, build things. Don't just like, let's say you're a wealthier person and you have people to do that stuff for you. Great, do that. But if you free up your time, use it productively. Don't just sit around and talk about how awesome it is that you have all this money. You know, like there's no exception, whether you're rich or poor, use the time you have to God's glory. That's kind of what he's saying. Like, and this will help protect you from the sexual temptation, from the lust, from the desire, from the coveting, from all the things God talks about. Use what you have and give thanks for the opportunities God gives you each day. And you will be blessed as you see God work through and bless everything you do. Absolutely. And you see the the heart of pride or boastfulness or wanting to get your own will across and force it on others. That was the heart of a lot of that oratory society. And the connection I'll make today is... That's totally like today. ...is social media. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's given a bad name, a general bad name often, and certainly can be can become an addiction, can share lots of bad things. So if you're not on it, fine. But if you are, use it for wholesome talk and not to get your will across, but to serve others and to get the good message of God out there. Use it to connect to people, uh, to get into their lives in ways that you couldn't, maybe physically, but digitally you're able to connect with more people in good ways yeah use it intentionally if you're going to go on there go on it and i wouldn't even say set a timer because it's so yeah. easy to get like caught in it and just keep scrolling scrolling and then you're idle yeah. and then where are you going where's the devil going to take you right. i know there's a lot of ads on social media and they're not good no. <laughs> and that no. can easily get you down a terrible rabbit hole even in your thoughts and like it's dangerous when you let your mind just wander because you go into mindless thinking same thing with watching tv you gotta watch out for that so like go on it with a purpose yep. and then get out and go do something else. Don't waste your life. Uh, we only got so much time here. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Work. Work. Absolutely. Work is good. Work is good. And it doesn't have to just be like your job work, but volunteer, uh, be involved in your community, be active in your community. It has nothing to do with your capabilities or being an extrovert or introvert, it's time and faithfulness. Go and be involved, work, especially uh, pause and think about what God has given you in your body and what it can do. You know, it's physical limits, it's emotional and intellectual and the spiritual and be out there and live. One thing yeah. And one thing I was recently given that's really given me a lot of just joy and peace and confidence is good brothers speaking into me, uh, you know, being very open and transparent about struggles and securities and fears. Yes, that doesn't go away. It's something that every pastor in person struggles with. But then have someone just drill it into your brain. Dude, let it go. Christ has taken it away. That's not who you are. You don't have to live punishing yourself. You don't have to live hindering yourself because you're like, oh, I made this mistake before. Or yeah, I struggle with that. Instead, define yourself by how God defines you. You are a child of God who's been redeemed. You are a baptized child of God who has been made new. Get up. Seize the day with the freedom that you have been set free from yesterday. You are free to serve God today. There's so much potential. What gifts do you have that you could use for God, for others? And then, like it says in here, to win the respect of outsiders. Why do we do that? So that they may know the name of our Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, okay, who can we save today? And if that person's standing next to you in heaven, whoa, shivers. I think every time I think about that, if just think, if you get one soul to heaven, Man, I can go to heaven today. 
My job is done. No, God's got a lot of work for you. Let's say you get five people to heaven and they in heaven come up to you and say, thank you. You got me here. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's cool. It is. They need you. Get out there, friends. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. G, you want to say a prayer for us and close us out? And until yeah. next time, my friends. Yeah. Lord Jesus, our Father in heaven, Holy Spirit, uh, continue to build us up in the faith that we would love one another, love everyone, that we would be found holy and blameless uh, when you return to bring us home to heaven, the place that you have prepared for us. <clears throat> Help us to be subject to you and not lost to ourselves or man-made societal human rules that always change, that bog us down, that separate us from you, that kill and hurt and harm and destroy. Instead, let us live as your people. Help us to live as people who appreciate uh, your gift of sex, your gift of marriage, gift of children, of lifelong committed companionship. Keep us uh, aware of those things that pull us into temptation to take our thoughts, our eyes, our hands captive immediately uh, when things uh, start us down a bad path and uh, pull us back to things that are good and right for you and for others. Help us to use our words, time, actions, to be faithful to you. Uh, so again, uh, many may see your light through us, hear about their Savior Jesus, and be brought to faith. And uh, let us work. Let us do the good work of your kingdom, and that good work of your kingdom is going to work and providing for ourselves and for our families. It's the good work of uh, being out in society and doing things that are constructive, it's a good work of uh, enjoying even our own hobbies and the gifts that you've given to us. We look forward to the next time we'll get to gather together on First Thessalonians in the Word and be filled up by your Spirit. And we pray all these things in your name because in your name we trust. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.